What is the favorite way that you spend your time? What's, what's the thing? I like reading use? old science books from centuries ago. Watching first how people spoke differently, well, wrote differently, mm -hmm. different palette of vocabulary, and then also how we thought of what was true in the universe and whether or not that perceived truth survived further testing. And look at people who are brilliant but still make certain assumptions that wouldn't be true but would be so obvious later. I would like navigating the tortured men mental pathways of the discoverers that have come before us. If you had to pick, and maybe this isn't a fair question, but is there one discovery that is really the most important in terms of setting the stage for everything to flow from it, whether it's technology today? There are two, separated by 200 years. Okay. Uh, one of them was Newton discovering that there's such a thing as laws of nature that can be written with mathematics. Once you have a mathematical representation of how the universe works, you can now manipulate the equations, and as such, you're manipulating the universe. If the equation is an accurate measure of how the universe actually works, then you could do things to the equation, and the equation could tell you, hey, look for this, and you'll find it. There it is. Set up this other experiment, and you'll discover this, because it comes right out of the equations. There it is. That was the birth of human beings using laws of nature to predict how the universe works. And that essentially birthed the Industrial Revolution. Another one was the 1920s. Hubble discovers that the Milky Way is not alone in the universe, that there are other galaxies, and then discovers the universe is expanding. And then we discover that the atom and inside the atom is unlike any other laws of physics we had previously dreamt of. It's the birth of quantum physics. At the time, it was like, what good is this? This is just for egghead physicists to entertain themselves. Quantum physics is the very foundation of our entire information technology today. There would be no computers. If, if you added up the value of quantum physics-derived technologies to the world economy, it would be like a third of the world economy. The lesson there is, I mean, for basic research, uh, no matter how obscure it may seem to you, if you go up and say, I require that that has a practical use today, you are cutting you off. Stunt it, yeah. You are stunting the yeah. future economies of your nation. And in fact, you said something about people challenging the space program and why we need to continue to support NASA. And you took an example of somebody waking up, and if you removed all of those things in their life, can you tell that? I love that oh, example. Yeah, I was just, you know, it's one of these diabolical thoughts you have <laughs> as a scientist. I want to sneak in the dark of night and like take away everything they have in their home that was either directly or indirectly inspired by our journeys into space. Then the person wakes up the next morning and they are technologically impoverished. But not even well, wait, 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 I'm not even, I'm not done. Okay. Then you go in and okay. remove the LASIK surgery that they had okay. because that was enabled cheaply and accurately because of an algorithm used to dock the space shuttle to the space station. And then the next time he drives around the curve in the road right. and he flies off the curb because he didn't have the traction enabled by grooves in the pavement, <laughs> the entire urge to miniaturize electronics was stimulated by NASA's need to make small cameras, small transmitters, small receivers, small everything that ultimately now sit on our hip pocket. I never, ever would have thought of that. I'm just saying. You're just saying it well. I'm just saying. What's the most popular question you get asked? It's, um, is there life in the universe? That's the top three. Another one is, what was around before the universe? Okay. That's a tough one. Yeah, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a stumper. And occasionally there's like, what is the meaning of life? You know, that's, oh, so people save their biggest questions for wow. the astrophysicist. Can you picture infinity? Can you wrap uh, your hands well, around? Well, in physics, you get early training with infinity. But right? I thought the human mind could not conceive of it. No, you can't. Not really. But you can grow accustomed to it so that it doesn't freak you out when someone talks about it. But so, every time I picture infinity, I put the, a shoebox stops it. And then I do another black thing beyond that, but then there's still... 
Well, that because there's no shoebox in Infinity. <laughs> Leave the shoebox at home. I'm trying. Okay, so now if you really want to freak out, there are actually some infinities that are bigger than others. Come on. Yeah. Don't blow my mind yeah. like that. Well, yeah, I'm so, I didn't. I didn't warn you in advance about that one. So you can't go to the higher infinities until you're really comfortable with that first infinity. Can you go to the higher infinities? I go, I go two or three infinities. Yeah, I'm good for that. Seriously? Oh, totally. Do you want to go into space? Only if you're going to send me somewhere. Where would you want to go? If they say, oh, let's go into space. Well, we're going to, send, well, we're going to put you in orbit and drive around you the block. You wouldn't want to do that? No. What about all these other universes and all these oh, other Oh, I'm things being realistic I'm... within the capacity of our modern day technology. Let's not do that. Oh, fine. Then I'd like to see what our galaxy look like, looks like from above. Mm. Oh, yeah. That'd be cool. Can you picture other planets with all kinds of... Like, do you do that? Do you imagine what planets in other, other galaxies... Other life forms? Yeah. But, you know, I'm still trying to wrap my head around all the life forms on Earth. But here's something to lose sleep over. Okay. We can be impressed with... Uh, life on Earth and its diversity. However, behind closed doors, the biologist has to confess that all the biodiversity represented on Earth is a sample of one because all life on Earth has common DNA. Right. You cannot, in science, claim to truly understand your sample unless you have another sample to compare it with. So that's why it's been so difficult to define what life is and what life requires. We can say, well, life requires sunlight or energy or liquid water. And you can make these rules because that's what life on Earth requires. If you find life from another planet and it's life and it doesn't require liquid water, but it's got liquid ammonia coursing through, then it's, oh, well, life requires just a liquid. Oh, that planet, the star is too far away for the energy to matter. It's using energy from inside its planet. Okay, so life doesn't require sunlight. It requires just energy of any kind. So only when you have another sample can you then compare and contrast. And I would claim, what I like to fantasize about is what that life would look like. It would look more different from life on Earth than any two random creatures on Earth look from each other. So you're taking a mouse well, you got me there. Wait, no, and I, I, a hippo. Do you hear what I said? No, yeah, no, I'm, trying, and, I'm no, wait, trying. Mouse and hippo are both mammals. All right. Take a rose and a orangutan. Okay, that's good. Okay? Yeah. They both have common DNA at some point in their DNA strand. Okay. Now you go to another planet, it will look more different from any two things we pluck from the tree of life then those two things look from each other. When you can conceive of the universe as such a vast place, does it A, make you want to live in the moment a little more, or B, make you realize your own significance, or some combination of the two? When you understand what anyone in my field would call the cosmic perspective, it is simultaneously humbling and enlightening. It makes you feel small, yes, justifiably so. But if that sends you into depression, it meant you started with an ego unjustifiably large. <laughs> Good point. So it is the accurate understanding of our place in time and in space. But the fact that our three pounds of gray matter, our 15 pound head, allows us to decode much of what's going on in the universe out to its farthest reaches is itself an achievement. So at night when you look up, don't feel small, feel large, that what's going on in the night sky is in reach, even if only intellectually. Not only that, the connectivity of us to the universe, of us to all life on Earth, means the next time you walk out the front door, you recognize and embrace the kinship you have with the tree, with the other animals in the animal kingdom. I'm quite convinced that you cannot wage war in the presence of the cosmic perspective. You would just laugh. You say, what am I doing? What, you're standing on the other side of this line in the sand and I want to kill you so I can step over there? And there's this whole universe out there waiting to be explored? I, I cannot imagine 
Now, maybe that's why you don't find scientists leading countries into battle. I was just okay? thinking to myself, maybe they should become world leaders. That Perhaps may, we'd I, have less war. Oh, we would, we would be so curious about the stuff we don't know, we would go hand in hand into the laboratory. Space Chronicles. Tell us about the book, and obviously, I mean, you oh, are... Oh, it's simple. It's every thought I've ever had about our <laughs> past, present, and future in space exploration. It's a collection. It's a collection yeah. of all the ways that I've talked about why it is in our collective best interest to have a presence in space. And you make a compelling argument. So Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, thank you so much. Space Chronicles is his book. It's actually a fascinating nonfiction read. <laughs> and I want to thank you for being here. You've illuminated all of us. And well, we, could, we could go on all day. But I do want to put a big plug in for the book because I think not only is it a smart tome, but it lets us know why we have to keep pushing forward with what we're doing yeah, with space you. exploration. Thank you for that. So thank you for being here thanks with for having us me. today and thanks for watching Architect.